So we this morning have got Mike Burrows from the Open, from Open Doors, um, which is a ministry which focuses on the persecuted church. Um, we support them here at Connect Church, and um, so yeah, we've got the privilege and the honour of having him here in the house this morning. So church, will we stand to our feet and let's welcome up Mike Burrows. <laughs> Well, thank you, church. Please take your seats. It's amazing to be here. Thank you, Pastor Natalie, Pastor Mason, Pastor Adam, and Pastor Anita for the opportunity to be here this morning. And uh, man, there's just no other place I'd rather be than here in the house of the Lord together. Um, and, and just in the worship time, and thank you, worship band, for leading us into the, the presence of the Lord. And I just felt the Holy Spirit highlight a verse to me. Um, just over this last period of time, a lot of people have walked through uh, some really challenging circumstances. And what I felt the Lord say to me this morning is that, you know what, even though outwardly we may be wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And we might have uh, possessions that are wasting away, even our body wasting away, but you know what, even here in this moment, well, the presence of the Lord is here. I mean, the Holy Spirit is here this morning. Yeah. Holy Spirit, I pray you blow afresh through this place. Renew in Jesus' name. Every person in this room, every person online in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God, that we can be renewed even here, even now, by the wind of your Spirit in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself, but before I do that, I, I felt the, the Holy Spirit continue to, to speak to me quite often. I, I get a chance, actually it's a privilege, amazing privilege to, to speak in various churches, to represent open doors uh, through from traditional churches through to uh, churches like, like what we have here today. And, and I feel like there's a fresh wind on the, on the gifts of the Spirit. And, and I've just found that they've been really um, welcoming of the gifts of the Spirit. Quite often I share a few prophetic words. And I just felt this morning, uh, just a third row back there at the end, uh, sir, with the glasses down here. Uh, I felt like, um, like the, the Bible talks about, well, um, there, there's a lot of teachers, but there's not so many fathers. And I just felt like you're a, a father of the faith. And uh, I felt like I just saw this uh, gift of discipleship, being able to draw people uh, alongside you in their journey. Uh, and then in front of you in the black, just on the end as well, um, I felt like the Lord, um, that you've got a voice and that uh, there's, a, there's a spirit of breakthrough on you uh, to be able to bring the anointing, the presence of God uh, into a place, into an area where it hasn't been before, um, but just that spirit of breakthrough. Uh, and then lady on that second row uh, in the green, um, and so I, I just saw the um, bread multiplying in your hands, uh, and I just felt like that as the Lord gives uh, to you, I just see it multiplying, just that, um, the ability to make uh, something grow, and so I, I saw that there. And then a um, lady about fourth row back with sunglasses on this, uh, and you're holding a, a young boy uh, there. Yeah, and um, I just felt like the Lord saying that, um, that, that he sees you, that you're here for, for such a time as this, and, that, and I see the gifts of the Spirit flowing through you, and, uh, and the Lord's going to use you in mighty, uh, powerful ways. So, uh, so just a, um, a few words I felt like the Lord say, but my name is Mike Burrows. Um, I'm on team at Open Doors, and Open Doors helps people follow Jesus all over the world, no matter the cost. So in the toughest places on earth for the gospel, where they're standing with and supporting and strengthening and encouraging believers under persecution. And, and I've had this amazing privilege over the, the last seven years to be able to uh, serve the, the persecuted church and represent them by, by sharing some of um, just raising awareness, really, and, and raising prayer support, financial support for believers under persecution. Uh, but I feel like I've also been able to serve the Church of New Zealand uh, by sharing some of the, the stories and some of the lessons that we can learn from Christians who suffer for their faith. 
um, that there are many believers who've um, potentially been in prison for decades, uh, yet through it all maintain this close relationship with Jesus. And, and through it all, through beating, through torture, uh, through oppression, um, their faith remains strong and intact and, and even is stronger by the end of it. And, you know, certainly there is something that we can learn from them. And, and my heart is, um, look, I don't know what days to come will look like, but what I do know is that we have to, um, Psalm 68, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And I feel like the Lord wants to um, just impart into us some unshakable faith this morning uh, to walk through the days to come. What, what I find in the world of the persecuted church um, sometimes there seems to be less fear in the persecuted church than there can be in our own context. I mean, they know that persecution is coming, uh, yet, I mean, the, the Bible says in Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow um, because tomorrow is going to take care of itself, but do what I have called you to do today. And so we need to put Jesus number one in our life, not be worried about tomorrow. You know, even if things have been taken away from us, even through the, these floods and, and all of that, it's, it's such challenging times. But we live with this eternal faith. You know, the Holy Spirit is within us as a seal guaranteeing our inheritance in the saints. And that house is not going to wash away. We have our faith on the eternal rock of Jesus Christ. So um, it's just in my heart this morning, but uh, a privilege to be here. And, and really what I wanted to, to do was um, open a window, I guess, on our wider church family this morning. Um, I want to open a window in particular uh, in a nation that I had an amazing privilege to, to visit um, in August last year, and that was uh, the country of Egypt. And so I had this um, opportunity to uh, go on an open doors trip with the team. Um, and in fact, it was quite great in the, in the morning service, the 8 o'clock service. Um, there was a lady who put up her hand and said, oh, I smuggled Bibles into uh, China with open doors uh, many years ago. And, um, and so it's just got an amazing history. Uh, I mentioned Brother Andrew, who began our ministry. He wrote a book called God Smuggler. Uh, a lot of people have read that book. Uh, anyway, this is his ministry in, uh, you know, from smuggling Bibles into Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain. Now we reach out into many nations, uh, nations such as Egypt, uh, where, where I got a chance to go. Um, I did get to see the, the pyramids. I got up to, to get up close to the pyramids as well. Some people say, well, they're, they're bigger than what I thought. Some people say they're smaller than what I thought. Uh, anyway, I thought they were bigger. And so, um, but we got to, to go there and, and see them. And I just had this chance to, to meet a church that is very much an above ground church. Uh, the church in Egypt is not an underground church. Uh, there's amazing Christians there who publicly declare their faith. Even, even by the clothes you wear, um, it, it says that, that you're a Christian or not in the, in the cultural context where they live. And um, there's amazing churches there. But uh, when I arrived, the, the first man that we were talking to, um, Pastor Marta, he said, well, the day before you arrived yesterday, uh, an electrical fire uh, swept through one of our churches, killing 41. Um, now, the, the headlines did reach here in, in New Zealand. And the report immediately came out uh, saying that it was um, just due to faulty wiring. And, and, of course, it could have been an accident. But um, Pastor Marta said, well, well actually, um, we've had... Uh, two other churches uh, recently, both with electrical fires sweeping through, uh, trying to kill the, the people in the services. And, um, and he says, well, well, he feels and we feel that it was carried out by extremists. In fact, he said over the last 10 years in Egypt, there have been 2,000 Christian martyrs. So I'm not just talking about Christians who've been killed but I'm talking about Christians who have specifically uh, been killed because they believe in Jesus Christ, told to renounce their faith. If they don't, you'll be killed. And 2,000 in the last 10 years. So it's such a, a conflicted environment. Um, but the overwhelming theme that I came back with in my heart is that the Egyptian church is a victorious church. Just like the New Zealand church is a victorious church. I want to show you 
show that to you in the, in the Word, a few verses. But uh, my first verse this morning, one of my theme verses, John chapter 16 and verse 33, and it says this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There, there's a, really a, a promise there. You know, in this world, we will have trouble. It's kind of a given. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And, uh, and it was amazing to, to meet people who really are daily overcomers in their regular Christian life. Uh, we travel, we, we start off in Cairo, we uh, started to travel south along the Nile River, uh, 360 kilometers towards Asyut. And um, it, it's, uh, if, if you look at a satellite map of Egypt, uh, it's, it's all basically desert, covered in desert. But then you see this ribbon of blue, uh, which is the Nile River running north to south. And um, actually, it's running south to north. It kind of messes with you a bit, but it sort of it feels like it's running upstream, but it runs uh, from the high, the, the high part of Egypt, which is in the south, towards the north. And then there's, um, there's a couple of blue, uh, green ribbons either side, which is the irrigated uh, part of Egypt. So we went down to a suit and gathered together in a, um, in a small room, 40 degrees, and with a, a gathering of believers and, and just starting to, to hear their stories. And um, one of the last to speak was Nina. And Nina, she started to share about um, her ministry, her day-to-day -day life as she is there in a suit, uh, reaching out uh, to the area that, that she uh, feels called to by the Lord. And she, um, in fact, the, the week before we got there in the areas that she ministers in, uh, a mob of extremists came in as seeking to kill Christians. And the police arrived. There was a shootout. Uh, the kids were still in school and were hiding under their desks. And some of the, the kids were, were shot and killed. Um, none of them could return home that day. They, they stayed under their desks all night, um, didn't return home till the, the next day. And Nina says, well, actually, if, if I'm going out into this area and I don't hear gunfire, well, then it, it's not normal. It's, it's not a normal day. She says wherever she, she goes, she, she hears gunfire in, this, uh, in these places. She says it's, um, it's a dark area where she goes into. There's a lot of black magic. Um, the parents even use their, their kids in some of the, the rituals that they, uh, they have there. And she went into one village, and when she got in there, they offered her some tea, but they had poisoned her tea. They, they didn't want the gospel reaching into that place, and so trying to kill her, and she passed out. But then uh, she eventually did revive and, and actually continues to go and minister even into that particular village. Um, I don't know what you would consider to be like a closed door um, if you're trying to minister into an area. Perhaps those who are, you're ministering to are trying to kill you. It's like, okay, God, maybe that's not where you want me to minister into, uh, but like the Apostle Paul. Um, but she continues, she's like, that's not a closed door. And that's kind of the heart of open doors anyway. We, we call it open doors because, um, in fact, every country there is a door open to the gospel. You know, even in the toughest countries, even in North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, you know, we, we consider that there to be open doors for the gospel because you can't stop the expansion of the kingdom of God. So Nina, she, she says, well, look, don't, don't be afraid for me. Um, she says, uh, we, we are in the fire, but Jesus is there with us yeah. in the fire. Yeah. When she started ministering into this area um, in a suit, uh, there were four churches. And they were churches that were, you know, amazing to, to be just four in, in that whole region and uh, shining a light for Jesus. But now there are 70 70 churches she's helped to build. She's helping to disciple 3,000 people, and she has 150 people in drug rehabilitation houses as well. And so, oh man, just, just amazing to, to meet Nina, uh, to see her spirit, to see that she steps into this place quite often alone. Um, because no one's brave enough to go with her. But, um, but she actually has this group of women, actually, who are going in and ministering into this place. And, and it was amazing to meet 
um, a believer like Nina, who certainly lives what I would consider to be that victorious Christian lifestyle on that day-to-day -day basis, overcoming the challenges, no matter what they are, to bring the light of Jesus to those people. So Nina, she is an overcomer. But in fact, each one of us has overcome the world. I love 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Catch this. Catch this in your heart. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so we have actually overcome and we have won because we believe. But when we stepped from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, at that point, because Jesus Christ won the victory on the cross, not only did he die for us, but he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave, uh, he gained that victory. And ever, as soon as we step into eternal life, as soon as we accept Jesus as our Lord, we, uh, we overcome the world. And so now it's our, our mission, our, our goal, uh, to walk out that victory and that overcoming on that daily basis. They have um, a saying in Egypt. They've got a bunch of sayings, but um, one of the sayings is, well, the, the blood of the martyrs has irrigated the, the church of our land. They say that uh, for every Christian that is killed for their faith, that, that many more uh, are added to the church. And, and this couldn't be more true um, than of the, this next uh, person and group of people that, that I met. Uh, we, we got back to Cairo and uh, we went into uh, Butros Sayer Church. And man, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's a beautiful church. It's been standing for centuries and it really is um, built to, to the glory of God. And, and I got to go into this beautiful church. And, um, but as I walked through the doors of Butros Sayer Church, I actually walked the path of a suicide bomber. So in 2019, December 18th, a, a suicide bomber, a man with a um, bomb strapped around his, his body and um, concealed with clothing, uh, he stepped into this, this church. Now what he did is he, is he stepped into the, the church, um, he, he turned to the right uh, instead of turning to the left. Now, had he been a, a local member of that church, had he understood like uh, the, the protocols of the church, he, he should have known that he should have turned to the, to the left because that was the, the men's side of the church. So, so in that church, um, as in a lot of um, uh, Eastern churches, you, you have the, the women sitting on one side, the, the men sitting on the other side. And he turned to the, the woman's side of the church. And so one of the leaders of the church noticed immediately that something was um, not right about him, immediately walked up to him, seeing what was about to take place, wrapped his arms around the suicide bomber, pulled him to the ground, and the blast went off, killing both of them plus 28 others in the church. Had he got to the front of the, the service, um, he would have killed many more, but it was confined to, to 28. And, I mean, even like I said at the start, how great is it that we get to gather here and, and worship like this? You know, there's um, really no fear of that. We have to decide whether it's sunny enough uh, to come to church or kind of those sort of thoughts go through our mind, not the thought, well, you know, perhaps if I come to church, I'll leave with half my family because there might be a, a suicide bomber there. Now, the man who was sharing this um, story with us uh, happened to be the twin brother of the man who pulled the suicide bomber to, to the ground. And he, uh, we were there midweek, uh, that happened on a, on a Sunday, but we were there midweek and he was just there, he happened to be there and, and it seems like he's there most days of the week. And, um, and so we, we were with there and, and um, asked him the question and said, well, you know, aren't you afraid to keep coming to this church? And he says, he was standing next to his, his mate, uh, next to him, he, and they looked at each other, smiled and, and he turned back to me and he, and he says, we're not afraid. This is what it means to be a Christian. 
One of the amazing things is that um, the day after the, the bombing, before it really could get cleaned up, uh, the church was full with people worshipping the Lord and um, commemorating those who'd died beforehand, uh, the, the day before. And in fact, he said, the church has been consistently more full than before the blast. And, and then um, I overheard uh, a couple of them talking, and, and one of them said, well, you know, I, I just think that the extremists sometimes do a better job of church growth than some of our priests. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes in that environment, you just have to laugh. You know, you just have to um, make jokes and, and laugh. But, you know, it really did show me that you cannot stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. I mean, even as you read through the book of Acts, even from the beginning, you know, there, there's been persecution as a, as a theme through the Bible. But also a theme through the Bible is, is growth, expansion, multiplication. You know, God continues to push out and expand his church. In fact, some of the fastest growing churches in the world are in these conflicted environments. The fastest growing church in the moment um, is sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the fastest growing um, Muslim background believer church is Iran. The fastest growing persecuted church in general is still China. And the church continues to grow in these places. And it's really an inspiration to us. You know, these are ones that continue to live out their faith in their environment. And it really is just a, a challenge and encouragement to us. Let's continue to keep Jesus Christ number one in our life. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter what people think of us or what people think about what we believe. But let's keep Jesus as number one because we know that we're going to an eternal home. We're a part of an eternal family and we have the victory of Jesus Christ living within us through the Holy Spirit. And so that's what the Lord is, is calling us to. So again, our, our verse, 1 John 5, 4 to 5. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you, Jesus. So we have overcome. And I was thinking, well, well, what does it look like for us and, and in our lives to, to live that daily victorious life? Or perhaps first, what, what does it look like when we don't live that daily victorious life? Well, I was thinking about this, that the world actually has victory over me. The world has victory over me when the world's desires draw me away from God. 1 John 2.17 says, The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world has victory over me when it causes me to trust in it rather than trusting in Jesus. Psalm 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And the world has victory over me when it absorbs my energies when it controls my thinking and when it deceives me into trusting in my own strength. 1 Chronicles 16.11 says, Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. But see, I overcome the world. I have victory over the world when I place my trust in Jesus for every situation that I face. I mean, such a, a challenge for us at the moment. We can't place our trust in our bank account and our assets and the things around us. We simply can't put our trust in that, but we can put our trust in Jesus. I conquer the world when I find my strength in Jesus, even in the, the middle of my weaknesses. And I conquer the world when I'm more in love with Jesus than I am the things of this world. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, I, I was thinking about the, the love of God. I was thinking uh, about us loving God, and, um, and it reminds me, I, I did uh, get a chance to spend time with a, a monk uh, over in Egypt, and he had been a part of that monastery living there for 26 years up until this point, and he lives there at the moment. And, uh, and we got a, a chance to spend the afternoon with him and uh, have cups of coffee together and uh, just hearing about uh, what he does. And for the last 26 years, he's been waking up every day at 4 a.m. 
Uh, that's a, a challenge for, for most of us anyway, for a start. But this guy, he prays five hours a day. He then goes and works in the desert. It's a real desolate place around uh, that monastery. And he fasts for two-thirds of the year. Wow. And so this is a guy that has a, a lifestyle of sacrifice. So he says, well, it's a lifestyle of, of sacrifice. I don't own anything. Um, I've made a commitment that I'll live a single life, and, uh, and this, is, this is his commitment. It's, it's interesting. You can actually become a, a monk um, in that monastery. Um, Egyptian uh, men can decide to do that. Um, but he says, well, you can't just uh, come and opt out of life. You, you have to have something to give up. So, in fact, they don't accept anyone who doesn't have a university degree to, to be a monk. And so you have to actually have a future ahead of you showing that you've got something to give up. And if the Lord calls you to that, well, then you can come and, and be a, a monk in that environment. But um, we asked him again, you know, just trying to find uh, just questions, you know, something to, to learn, something to glean from people that, uh, that have these kinds of walk with the Lord. And we said, well, well, do you find it hard? Do you find it hard to live out this, this lifestyle? And and he says, well, some find it hard, but if you've fallen in love with Jesus, well, then it's easy. And, and I think, you know, when we're in love, um, well, then other challenges, difficulties seem to fade away a, a little bit. And just having um, heart and gaze and mind, you know, set on, on Jesus. And so I was thinking, well, you know, Am I more in love with Jesus this year than, than I was last year? You know, can, can I actually try and quantify that? You know, am I more in love with Jesus now? But then I was also thinking, perhaps even a, a better question is, am I more aware today of the love that Jesus has for me than I did last year? Because I feel like the victorious Christian life really lives out of, overflows out of that. How much are we aware that Jesus Christ loves us? You know, there's nothing we can do to separate us from the love of God. And, uh, you know, when, when we come to him, uh, he will receive us with, with open arms. Jesus Christ, he, he loves us so much. And that gives us that purpose and that foundation and that, that centering. And so as we grow in our love for God, um, as we understand his love for us, and we, we grow in love for, for each other as well and reach out our, our hands to, to our nation and across the world, um, Open Doors continues to do that. And so in Egypt, uh, we continue to, some of the work we do is church planting, uh, discipleship. We still get Bibles into the hands of believers uh, we do drug rehabilitation, houses, uh, family ministries, women's ministries. We, we basically go into a place and ask the church, what do you need? How can we help? And then we just try and meet those needs. And so, um, so you can go on to our... Thank you. So you can go on to our website, which is opendoors.org.nz, and, and find out a bit more uh, about what it is that we do reaching into these countries, and it's, it's just such an, uh, an amazing work that we do. But I thought I would uh, just share uh, one more place that, that I went to in Egypt, which you know, I really felt the, the presence of God as I, as I stepped into this, uh, this place, and it's called, it's called Cave Church. And Cave Church is the largest church in the Middle East. Uh, it seats 20,000 people. And it's got a, a, a partially overhung uh, by, by a cave. And, and it's an amazing place because it is uh, actually situated on top of a mountain. Um, and it has what they call garbage city uh, surrounding uh, this, this mountain. And, and in fact, in the, the 1980s, the um, Christians were exiled to Garbage City to, um, to recycle uh, the, the garbage of the city. 98% of the people who live there are Christians. And, and I find it amazing. It's kind of like uh, Jesus being born into a stable. It, it's like this gem of the Middle East. 
um, is there in the middle of Garbage City. You go through these uh, tight roads, you see trash, you know, piled up on the sides of the roads and into people's houses, and, and they, they sleep on the trash um, and in the trash. But in fact, uh, the kids tend to have cell phones. So <laughs> they've got trash all around, but still, you've got to have a cell phone. So uh, that's just what we saw. Um, but then you come out into this open, spacious place, which is uh, Cave Church. So it's situated on the top of this mountain. It's called Mount Mokotan. And our guide, uh, he was actually an archaeologist for 20 years. And so he was telling us some recent uh, history, but then also some ancient history as well. And he was telling us the story about um, this, this mountain, this church. So back in uh, 970 AD, uh, King Moaz challenged Pope Abraham, uh, Pope Abraham and said to him, uh, is your Bible real? Are the words in it true? And he says, well, yes. And so the king said, well, in that case, I want you to move this mountain. The Bible says you can do that. And if you don't move this mountain, I'm going to get rid of all the Christians in Egypt. And so the Pope um, left, you know, discouraged, fearful, didn't know what to do. And, um, and then in a dream that night, God spoke to him and said, find, uh, find Simon. Simon the shoemaker in Cairo, go find him, and you can work with him, and, and he'll tell you what, what to do. And so um, Pope Abraham uh, found Simon, and Simon said, okay, what we need to do is we need to get the Christians p fasting and praying for three days. So let's get word out as far and as wide as we can. They need to fast, and they need to pray. And so at the end of that three days of fasting and praying, they all gathered back at the foot of Mount Mokotan. Uh, the king was there, and as the Christians were singing... Lord, have mercy on us. There was a great earthquake, and the mountain started to shake. And then a portion of the mountain cracked and split and opened, and the sunlight shone through the other side. And yay, God, he made an earthquake. The, the Christians were spared. The, the king, uh, he says, okay, your God is, is alive and well. I'm going to spare the Christians. But one of the great things about that story is that... Um, story was recorded by a, a, a historian that wasn't a Christian. And then in 1980, and Cairo is just constantly under excavation, uh, they excavated the, the grave of Simon, this guy Simon the shoemaker. Uh, in his grave was a, a box, and then in the box was a scroll, and on the scroll uh, was that written account of the earthquake. So a second piece of historical evidence to confirm the story. So God is in the business of earthquake shaking and, uh, and bringing his glory uh, from heaven to earth. So praise you, Lord. But, but what I thought I'd, I'd do now is, is, can we pray together? I, I'd love to pray for the, the church of, of Egypt. I was just thinking, you know, the, the sun, you know, uh, rises on New Zealand and then uh, over the next 24 hours, so many people will be gathered in places and centers of worship. And we can pray for them. You know, we can pray for an hours, some hours to, to come. You know, Christians in Egypt will be gathering in these areas. And, and let's, um, let's just pray that they'll be protected, safe, and that the presence of the Lord would be there. Let's pray together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for bringing us here together today, for us here in this building, for those online. And, and I thank you, Lord, that we uh, sit here under an open heaven. I thank you, Lord, that our prayers, they reach beyond geographical boundaries and limits. And we can pray for the church of Egypt right now. So we lift them up to you, Lord. They're our church family. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray that today, Lord, that as families come to churches, that they would uh, be able to leave again as a whole family, Lord God. We pray for protection around them. Lord, we pray for your presence to come and fill every place in Jesus' name. Fill them with strength, fill them with wisdom, fill them with hope and the joy of the Lord, because we know the joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray, Jesus, you would continue to shine through your people, continue to reach out through them, Lord God, we pray that the message of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, will be preached throughout Egypt today and that people would come to, to find you in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for, for us here, Lord, in our nation. We pray that you would set that fire in our hearts 
Set it ablaze, burning brighter and brighter for you, Lord God. To put our faith first, Lord Jesus, to, to consider what it is that you would do, Lord God, in every situation. Holy Spirit, lead us by your guidance, Lord God. Hallelujah. So as we're, we're here, um, heads bowed, uh, eyes closed, um, and you've heard uh, today... Um, stories of people who've given their, their lives for, for the sake of the gospel and, and for Jesus. In fact, why don't we stand? Why don't we stand this moment? Please, um, let's, let's stand together. And let's just stay in this attitude of prayer. Attitude of prayer. Hallelujah. Heads bowed. You know, today, um, perhaps even hearing some of these stories that um, you may not have a relationship with Jesus or perhaps you have had and have drifted away a, a little. Um, today, uh, I feel like the Lord is calling us back, calling his people back. So if today you'd like to make a, a fresh recommitment to the Lord, um, why don't you just raise your hand? I can acknowledge it. You can put it down again. And I'd love to be able to, to pray together. We can join together in prayer. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if there's someone here today and you would like to, to come back to, to the Lord today, Having heard some of these stories, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence here with us. Hallelujah. You know, there could be people who are watching online as well. So, so what I'd love us to do is um, I'd love you to repeat after me. And this is a, a simple prayer, just asking Jesus to come into our hearts. So, so let's all repeat this together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I'm sorry for my sins, and I want your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me to take away my guilt and shame. I receive your forgiveness. And please send your Holy Spirit into my life to bring me peace and hope. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord God, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for every person online. I pray for that fresh wind of your spirit to come and fill us right now in Jesus' name. Empower us to go out into the world to shine for you, Lord God. Empower us to, to not be fearful for the challenges that we face ahead, but to know that we carry the love and the hope of Jesus Christ, that we carry salvation in our hearts. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing on the earth. Lord, we thank you for continuing to break through in so many situations and environments. Lord, you are alive and well, and for that we give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Thanks so much. Bless you. Thank you so much, Mike. What a great message, and wow, really opened my eyes to... Um, stuff that I never knew was going on around the world. So, yeah, thank you so much. Let's put our hands together one more time for Mike. Thank you. Great message. And if you did make a decision to follow Jesus um, this morning, there will be a pastor at the back with a Bible um, yeah, for you. So please um, go and see one of the pastors after the service. And we would love to talk to you. And a party is going on in heaven right now. So, so awesome. But would you put out your hands and I will pronounce a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Shalom. Amen. Amen.